He is one of the rising stars of the Indian pharma sector, representing Gen Next, the young and dynamic Nilesh Gupta, MD of Lupin. Nilesh, thank you so much for taking our time and speaking to ET now. Sure. Now, there's been a growing sense of optimism around the new Modi regime, which has hit the road running. Uh, it has unleashed a lean and mean government, the main focus of which is to boost domestic production and also to revive the investor sentiment. Do you share the same optimism? And if yes, why? So, yes, I do share the optimism. Um, the, uh, you know, the fundamental reason for this is I think we need a stable government. And I think there were just too many detractors in the way that the government was structured before. You know, they have good, uh, solid majority the way they do. And I think that itself is the uh, biggest driver for my optimism. You know, decisions will be made, actions will be taken. You know, before we talk about enablers of growth, I think we need to take away the detractors. And I think, I think that's what, uh, you know, this government is all, all set to deliver on. And, you know, as I understand, you know, the overall stance has been very pro-development all this while. And that's what we would love to see going forward as well. All right, Nilesh, point taken. Now, there is a sense in the pharma sector that the pricing regime uh, should be reduced and that the government should perhaps take a more rational view uh, because what the sense in the pharma sector is that if that doesn't happen, then many of the local pharma players will be perhaps discouraged from manufacturing essential drugs. What are your expectations from the new government on this uh, disturbing aspect of the pricing regime? So, so I, I think price control is here to stay, right? You can't... Uh... And I think it will create utter confusion if we try to take it out at this point of time. So, you know, it's there, it's market-based, that's fine, right? You know, um, there's a lot of price controls, a lot of places around the world. You go to Japan, you go to Australia, you go to Europe, you see price controls all over the place. And this is a market-based price control, so it's fine. I think there's confusion, um, you know, um, there's been talk about what should be considered when calculating the pricing, what should not be considered, you know, and, and I think those are the things that we need to probably do a give and take on. Um, there was confusion on combinations, there was confusion on uh, when and how to be implemented. Um, I think, you know, we can work with any system. It has to be a good, fair, transparent system. As long as that is there, it'll work. So I think, you know, we'd, we'd love to engage as an industry at some point of time to talk about price control, to talk about how it can perhaps be tweaked so that it still meets the objective of uh, bringing down healthcare cost, but you know, it, it makes sense from our perspective as well. You mentioned some of the aspects uh, that need attention as far as pricing regime is concerned. What's the topmost priority over here? Could you stick an account? So what, what irks me is the fact that any, uh, any pricing which is over 1% of the market share is included in the calculation. You know, I would have loved to see a weighted average uh, calculation so that the market leaders who are defining the market share are the ones that define the pricing as well. To me, that's the kind of stuff which would be sensible. So I, th I think, you know, this is, the, this is the kind of stuff we need to look at. What about uh, regulatory reforms around uh, clinical trials? In some cases, uh, you've had uh, clinical trials being pushed offshore. Uh, that is, of course, to stop the development that has already taken place. Uh, there seems to be a sense of discontentment, uh, discontentment uh, over this particular aspect as well. How do you think the government should handle uh, clinical reforms? Because that's very important uh, from a domestic point of view. So I, th I think this is a major issue. Um, you know, and, and I smiled because uh, you know we're guilty of the same. We're, we're you know you can't wait around waiting for regulatory process to clear up so that you can start a clinical trial. It'll take you one year, two years to start the trial itself. You know, the general sense in the industry is. Don't even try to do a clinical trial in the first place in the country. Um, but I think if we have a good, fair, transparent system, if we're uh, you know making sure that people's interests are not compromised, if if clinical trials are regulated but not regulated to the extent of not happening at all, you know I think I think it'll work. Um, you know today it's completely fractured. All right, from clinical trials, let's talk about R and D now. Research and innovation are perhaps at the heart of the sustained growth of every pharma company. Do you think enough is being done on the ground to incentivize R&D or perhaps the government can do much more? Yeah. So you could always do more, right, from, from that perspective. And, but I think the, the general lens has been pro-research. You, know, you know, we've always had weighted deduction in R&D, for example. Um, I don't think adequate incentives uh, exist for, you know, uh, industry and academia collaboration, for example. And I think those are the kind of things that you could probably address. If you go anywhere else in the world, you see much richer 
relationships between universities and uh, industry and you just don't see that enough in india right you don't see adequate output coming uh, out of those alliances even though some of those alliances exist um, that's where i think uh, is one place that we could do we've certainly talked about weighted deduction we've uh, talked about enhancing that weighted deduction you know I th we need to be reasonable even from the industry perspective but we're happy to chat and think you know whatever is sensible whatever happens globally is what we should try and follow as well there are some minor tweaks about what gets covered what doesn't get covered that's another area that should be looked at let's now talk about the budget which is perhaps going to be one of the most eagerly awaited events of the year as far as the modi regime is concerned now there seems to be a part of the pharma lobby which is uh, pushing for tax swaps uh, and we are talking about uh, tax benefits as far as special economic zones are uh, concerned uh, there is a push to perhaps extend the swaps to the pharma sector too uh, to keep in mind uh, the timelines as far as manufacturing is concerned do you think that's going to help yeah so you know let's look at let's go back in the genesis a little bit we used to have eous and then the government switched to special economic zones um, obviously that inspired interest in people and people set up their own secs people set up uh, you know outfits in existing secs as well um putting mat on this is taking 20% out of the entire equation right um, from that perspective you know this is something which was changed this is certainly it's not something which is planned uh, originally mm. and you know we'd love to have a chat about that and i know that industry wants to have a chat on something like that um if you if you look at it from a competitive advantage you know if you are not getting taxed on that count you are also competitive that much more than anybody else you know internationally we compete with uh, with companies which have sub 10% you know uh, tax rates you know we're not talking about anywhere getting close to that because as a company we still pay mat but if we have that then that gives you the leverage to be more competitive and you know indian, indian manufacturing has to be competitive all right now we all know that the indian pharma sector is primarily driven by exports and there are a significant chunk of revenues that are clocked from the us business in this regard perhaps the ties of the relationship between the indian government and the us government uh, require a lot of focus and there are several players who believe that india needs to take a firm stand uh, a recent example is the fact that india has been retained on the priority list the priority watch list of alleged violators of the us patent law what efforts can the government perhaps do to ensure that india is no longer on the list so i think this is obviously a complicated issue um but importantly i think the indian government has to just engage you know i think good transparent dialogue needs to happen to settle the concerns that there are um uh, there are issues which are uh, being raised on the ipr front uh, there's some people who feel very strongly about it compared to others um but i do think that the indian government should engage in good dialogue with the us government on this count now oh, big pharma has also been opposed to the issuing of compulsory licenses in india and uh, we've had an instance of uh, natco getting the compulsory license for bayer's uh, cancer drug nexavar that was clearly not well received by big pharma and that has perhaps contributed uh, to a frosty relationship what's your take on this aspect so this is obviously a sore topic but uh, uh, compulsory licensing will never be received well right from anywhere it's we're not the only country in the world to ask for compulsory licensing there are lots of other examples as well if the case is right if there if the rules are followed as per the laid down rules which have been agreed upon yes we should allow compulsory licensing it doesn't mean that you go left right and center and allow compulsory licensing for each and every product because that would completely fracture the process but where where the merits are for the case it certainly should be allowed all right now another so point you spoke about so point another so point between the domestic pharma players and big pharma is patent protection and we all know the repercussions that followed the supreme court verdict in the case of novartis uh, for their drug uh, glivec do you think that there perhaps need to be there perhaps needs to be uh, a review of indian patent laws so i don't think there needs to be a review of the of the overall patent law you know there's been a lot of debate and that's where it's got to the place that it is you know india as a country respects patents you know we lupin you know or any other company from india would also stand to disadvantage if we did not respect patents because all of us are trying to do proprietary stuff as well if we can't patent what we make um how would that work so you know we do respect patents as a country you know if there are sore issues there needs to be a process to discuss those issues it just can't be based on feelings or facts you know i think it needs to be 
you know, discussed, debated, and then decided on. Uh, we'll continue our exclusive conversation with Nilesh Gupta, uh, Lupin MD, in the next segment. Keep watching ET Now. Welcome back to ET Now. I'm in conversation with Nilesh Gupta, MD of Lupin. Nilesh, now in the past uh, recent few weeks, there's been a, a lot of instances of cases wherein there have been several of uh, several of your peers, in fact, who have come under intense regulatory scrutiny as far as the US FDA is concerned, and all these cases pertain to uh, quality compliance. Tell us, how is Lupin placed uh, to handle this increasingly intense scrutiny uh, by the US regulator? I think the FDA has a, fa a fair and transparent system that they follow. Um, it's something which is pretty much documented and pretty much clear in terms of what expectations are. Um, so I think you know what is being perceived as intense scrutiny, and obviously the facts speak, right? There's a whole bunch of warning letters, more from India than from anywhere else in the world at this point, and obviously it it, it looks like this comes out of intense scrutiny alone. There's not a single big pharma Indian company which wouldn't have an audit every month, right? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there'd be probably a couple of audits going on in the country at any point of time, and a you know like a company like Lupin or Sun or Dr. Reddy's would face audits every single month from some regulatory body or the other. And that's just the nature of the business. So you need to be in line with compliance. You need to be in line with what regulations are expecting you to be. And uh, you know, it's not altogether impossible. I think the FD understands that there will be issues, there will be problems when you manufacture. Obviously, when you're gonna make hundreds of batches a day, things will go wrong. Mm -hmm. What do you do when things go wrong? You know, How are issues handled at that point of time? That's what they want to see. Do you think that there is a gap between perhaps what the Indian regulators expect from the pharma companies in India vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the foreign reg regulators expect from Indian companies as far as the uh, business in their jurisdiction is concerned? So regulators are never going to be aligned. Um, if you look at Europe versus US, if you look at US versus India, India versus Europe, you're never going to see alignment. And I think alignment is something that people have tried to work towards mm. as regulatory bodies, but that's not happened across the board. So there are differences in expectations. If there's something good from the European authorities, uh, regulations, we try to use that even when we're working for a US FDA inspected plant. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what you need to do. So there'll always be differences. There'll always be differences in capabilities as well. Uh, you just have to aspire for whatever is the best in the lot. All right, now let's focus from the US FDA to Lupin. You've been trying for several months to get clarity on the entire FII investment limit. Uh, we understand from reports that uh, Lupin has also written to the cabinet secretary to get clarity in this regard. Could you give us an update? <laughs> We've written to everybody that we can. Um, I unfortunately do not have an update where I feel we're close to the uh, resolution of the matter. But you know, this is typically the kind of thing that I'm talking about, about taking away detractors, you know, and forget enablers. You know, we've been trying for close to a year to get this permission, to get this limit relaxed, and it's not happened. And it's hurting us. It's hurting do you think us the delay the bothers you? Obviously, it's, uh, it's hurting us uh, from a stock market perspective. It's hurting us from a market cap perspective. Uh, there definitely is impact. All right. Now, Nilesh, uh, there are several Indian pharma companies that are believed to be in talks with a lot of suitors, a lot of overseas suitors. We've seen a lot of speculation around several pharma deals perhaps being in the pipeline. Would Lupin at any stage be open to inducting a strategic foreign investor? Um, not in the whole, not in the whole company. Um, and simply because, you know, I think it depends on what we want to achieve long term. Um, would we be willing to do a joint venture in a particular therapy area in India, for example? 100%. We'd, we'd love to do that. Would we be interested in a product category? Let's say we take injectables and try to partner with somebody mm. in that space. Certainly, we'd be very happy to consider that. But I think, uh, I think an overall investment does not meet our future requirements we, we you know you know by the grace of god we don't need uh, uh, you know we're not in dire needs of funds or anything of the sort we have a good sound robust business model i think it's just about growing and how fast you can grow um, in that i don't think an overall equity investment would make sense into lupin perhaps a minority stake sale if at all the need is required at a later stage i don't think so I don't, I don't think that will be a requirement. All right, I'll leave it at that. Now, you've also set yourself a very ambitious target of uh, clocking $5 billion in revenues by 2018. That is a goal that you had set for yourself. Uh, is that plan on track? And also, can you tell us your strategies for achieving the same? So we've never met our, our long-term plans. We've always missed them by a year. So, you know, and, and I think the market's been very forgiving, right? As long as you're going in the right direction, 
if you miss the goal by a year or not you know it depends on the forex it depends on so many things as well um, but the general direction is well set and i think uh, you know the drivers of growth that we put in place as far as markets as far as product categories as far as the people that we have driving our various businesses are all in place to deliver on that so we are we are largely on track whether that happens in 18 or 19 that's that's a different discussion but we are well on track all right Nirish, point taken uh, we'll continue our conversation with Nirish gupta on the other side of the short break stay tuned to et now Welcome back to ET Now. We're in conversation with Nilesh Gupta, Lupin MD. Nilesh, in the short term, do you have any plans of perhaps exiting some of your weaker brands and buying out stronger ones? If yes, what kind of monies are you planning to uh, raise? The idea was um, us and, and most other Indian companies have very heavy band, brand load on the representative. Right? You're talking about a representative that ends up talking about 30, 40 brands. In his, uh, in his offering, right? That's way too many brands. If you look at the US, people talk about three products. The idea was, you know, does it make sense to sell all those products? Does it make sense mm -hmm. to look at product-wise profitability and see the ones which don't make sense in our portfolio, but could make sense to somebody else? And it's purely from that perspective. This is an exercise that we're planning to undertake, mm -hmm. right? We haven't even started. So I think we're planning to undertake in the next six months and then see what comes out of it. It's not from a perspective of, okay, let's use that money to buy something else. Okay. Um, it's really from the perspective of does it make sense to sell the products that we're doing. Getting rid of the flap perhaps and some of the non-